Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfi, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the First Guide to Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching the video version or listening to the podcast audio version through iTunes and other leading providers, thank you very much for your continued interest and support. And if you're not already, make sure to subscribe. Subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. Tell a friend, family members, love that support. This episode features a true giant of funk, R&B, and pop music, founder and leader of Cool in the Gang, Mr. Robert Cool Bell. As the group celebrates 50 years of releasing records in 2019, it also looks back at one of the most successful strings of hit songs ever generated by any act in any genre. Between Cool in the Gang's 1969 debut album and the late 1970s, the jazz-trained ensemble rang up 22 top 40 R&B singles, most of which were among the greatest funk tracks ever produced. They included classics like Funky Stuff, Jungle Boogie, Spirit of the Boogie, Hollywood Swingin', Music is a Message, Higher Plane, Soul Vibration, Who's Gonna Take the Weight, Love and Understanding, Open Sesame, Pneumonia, NT, Love the Life You Live, Good Times, Slick Super Chick, and so many more plus the dreamy instrumental Summer Madness. Their distinctive sound of urgent syncopated rhythms, powerful and brassy horn blasts, group vocal chants, and overall house party atmosphere was evident right from the first record, and unlike anything else during Funk's peak era. Having peaked in 1973 with the immensely popular Wild and Peaceful album that included three top five R&B singles, all of which also cracked the pop top 30, by the end of the decade, the band had lost its spark and was faltering among the rise and demise of disco and swell of smoother R&B. Cool and the Gang went into the studio and reinvented itself unlike perhaps any group had before or has after. Enlisting a true lead singer for the first time in James J.T. Taylor and bringing in Yerma Del Dotto to produce the band unveiled a much more polished sound in 1979 with the release of the Ladies' Night album and what turned out to be a number one R&B top 10 pop smash in the title cut. Although many from Cool and the Gang's core fan base of funk enthusiasts, present company included, were put off by the more mainstream style, it did attract legions of new fans and totally turned around the group's fortunes. Cool and the Gang would spend the next decade as one of Pop's leading hit makers, amassing 16 top hits on the Pop chart, including the number one monster, Celebration. At the same time, those singles continued to score on the R&B charts as well. They included songs like Too Hot, Take It to the Top, Jones vs. Jones, Take My Heart, Stepping Out, Get Down On It, Big Fun, Let's Go Dancing, Joanna, Tonight, Fresh, Misled, Cherish, Emergency, Victory, and Stone Love. By the end of the 1980s, a string of releases and hits fell off, and JT unsuccessfully pursued a solo career. Subsequent decades would see Cool and the Gang continuing to draw well as a live act at picking up Lifetime Achievement Awards, with Cool, his keyboardist brother Ronald Bell, drummer George Brown, and JT being inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2018. But that period also saw, saw them seldom releasing new music. Having long sought to present the Cool and Gang story, Truth and Rhythm finally caught up with Cool during some holiday season downtime in Florida. He shares how the band first got its jazz sea legs as the Jazzy Axe before honing its funk chops as Cool and the Gang with considerations of all the amazing albums and tracks. Cool also talks about so many unforgettable moments as well as collaborating with his son, Prince Hakeem, on a new single called Royalty, and planned upcoming new Cool in the Gang music as well. Cool was sequestered in a hotel event room for this interview, and he held out as long as possible before people invaded that room. With that, it's time to get down, get down with the original Jungle Boogeyman, Mr. Robert Cool Bell. 
I'm so pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, legendary bassist and leader of one of the most successful funk, R&B, and pop bands of all time, Mr. Robert Cool Bell of Cool and the Gang. Welcome, sir. Hi, how are you doing? Doing very well, thank you. So great to have you. Been a big fan, as I was telling you, uh, for, for many, many years, almost since the beginning. So it's a thrill to have you on the show. Okay. Where are you coming to us from today, uh, Cool? All uh, right now, I'm in uh, Old Town. They call it Old Town, Orlando, Florida. Ah, well, that's a good good uh, place to be this time of year. Yeah, it's a little cold up north, but I got to go back next week, so it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as I was telling you before we on the air, I've been uh, hooked ever since I first heard that gong and that get down, get down in 1973. And so it's a, a tremendous story to have you on the show, and the viewers are going to just love it. Okay, thank you. So um, let's jump in. Um, if we could just talk a little bit, uh, cool, about um, you know how you first got into music and, and what it was like being part of that musical family. Well, we started back in 1964. At that time, we called ourselves the Jazzy Axe. And we were listening to uh, John Coltrane and uh, Miles Davis and all the jazz cats, you know, that's how we came up to the name Jazzy X. Now we're very young. And, um, and from there we got involved with an organization called the Soul Town Review. And we became the Soul Town Band. And we had to learn all the, uh, well, not a lot of hits from Motown, because Soul Town Review was trying to be like Motown. So we became the Soul Town Band. And we would have to play behind these guys. And that lasted for about a year, maybe maybe two. And then we left that organization and we were working in a club in Newark called the Blue Note. And they asked us, uh, one of the MCs had made a um, poster. He had Cool and the Flames. So he had Cool like in a block of ice and the flames, the fire melting the ice into the flames. And we um, changed our name to Cool and the Flames. Now, a little, about maybe about six months after that, we ran to a producer by the name of Gene Red. And he became the producer and manager. And um, we said, well, you know, you got James Brown and the Famous Flames. You can't really use that name. Uh, the Godfather wasn't having it. So we thought about, well, many names to call ourselves. So I said, what, what are you going to call ourselves? So all the guys said, well, just call ourselves Cool in the Gang. Because the music was jazz, funk, R&B. And it was a hip name. And we became Cool in the Gang. That was in 1968. The first record came out in 1969. So next year, July 3rd, 2019 will be 50 years. Wow, that's amazing. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, so, and uh, I have these records here, so there's that first one. That's it. That's yeah. Cool in the Gang, my Cool in the Gang, yeah. established in 1969. <laughs> what uh, what uh, actually first attracted you to, to playing the bass, though? To play where? Playing the bass, how did you choose that as your instrument? Well, I mean, uh, you talk about my influence. Uh, well, you're you're a bass player, and I'm wondering what what brought you to that instrument. Oh, see, yeah, okay. I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. Well, I was playing percussions in the beginning, bongos, I kind of like that. And uh, one night we were working in the... Um, uh, club called Cafe Wa. And uh, every Sunday, they would have a hoot nanny Sunday, okay? And uh, we would play in potato chip, turkey sandwich, whatever. And um, I had been playing and fooling around with uh, one of the guys uh, in the band. His name was Robert Spike Mickens. And uh, uh, his brother played guitar. And every now and then, I would fool around with his guitar. So, 
I learned how to play one song on the guitar on the E string, and that was called Coming Home Baby. So my brother, my brother uh, Ronald Bell, Khalees Bell said, well, yeah, why don't you uh, play bass uh, on this one song? I said, well, I don't know anything on uh, bass. He said, yeah, play Coming Home Baby. So I tried it, and it was all on the E string, one string, and that was it. After that, I said, yeah, I'm going to learn how to play bass. That's how it started. I'm guessing uh, maybe James Jamerson, or who were some of your early like uh, influences? Yeah, James Jamerson, uh, Ron Carter, uh, Reggie Workman, uh, Paul Chambers, you know, all the greats. Yeah, wow. So when you guys made this first record, you know, to me, you know, all the all the things were already there, the pieces were already in place for that Cool in the Gang sound. You know, I mean, you developed it further, but when you listen to it, it's there with the way the horns are and the way um, the um, the rhythm is. You know, how did you kind of get that distinctive sound right out of the gate? Yeah, that that came from uh, you know. Uh, uh, playing the jazz, uh, our style of jazz that wasn't being influenced by the great jazz artists and backing up all those bands, you know, that built our chops up. So we would have to learn, you know, Temptations and Beauty and Skin Deep and uh, Smokey Robinson tracks and and then uh, Junie Walker and All-Star tracks and, uh, and James Brown tracks, you know, Cold Sweat, you know, and There Was a Time and all that. So that created the sound when we uh, made our first album, which you have there, Cool in the Gang. I mean, tracks like Give It Up, I mean, that was just such a hot JB style kind of jam, you know? Yeah, because we didn't really have any singers back in the early days, as you know. And uh, we had fun doing the, those type of tracks, you know, those the type of licks and adding uh, our own thing to it, you know. Da -da 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 you know, it was cool, man. Very cool. <laughs> and, you know, you brought up James Brown, and I understand that he was, you know, a noted fan of yours almost from the beginning, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. James Brown, yeah. He, he kept the uh, fuck alive, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, going to see James Brown at the Apollo Theater or uh, Roosevelt Stadium in Jersey City, and yeah, James Brown was definitely the man. But, I mean, he gave his, like, approval to Cool in the Gang, I mean, that must have been something when you knew that he, you know, respected you guys. Yeah, we felt good about that, you know. The Godfather saying that we are okay, you know, our funk must have been pretty funky, huh? <laughs> so cool, you know, you uh, did a couple live albums after that. Um, what was the reason for that? Was it just easier to do some live records before doing another studio record? Yeah, that was, uh, um, at that time, Gene Red was still with us on that first one, and we wanted to do something different. It was uh, live at the Sex Machine in Philadelphia. And um, and then it became live at, okay, <laughs> so you got the product. And then we did live at PJ's out in L.A., you know. So, you know, we were... Um, we felt good doing live albums as well because you can stretch out and do your thing. Were you uh, comfortable on stage right from the beginning? Pretty much so. I mean, uh, it, it's yeah. in the beginning, you know, we started, you know, like I said, playing in smaller situations. And uh, um, when we started, to, um, well, actually, when we did our first gig at the Apollo Theater. Then when you came into a larger stage, you talk about the Apollo Theater, so, you know, that was a lot of pressure on us, you know. But um, there was this group called Willie Feaster and the Mighty Magnificence and Skip Sonny and the Page Brothers, about 15 of those guys. So they had singers and dancers, and we had the, our little record cool gang, and uh, shoot, they ran us back home. That was the first 
beginning of uh, a teaching that's hey, it's about show business. You can't sit back and play jazz. It's going to be jazz funk. We had to, you know, really get into it. But yeah. Let the music take your mind. I mean, that was one of the really hot early, early tracks. That was a, a prop, maybe your first classic, I think. Oh, you think so, huh? Okay, yeah. That, we had fun with that record, you know. Um, and then in and, the live one, who's going to take the weight? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, somebody was just talking about that the other day. Yeah, too, who's going to take the weight was uh, one of those songs, you know. Uh, the type of, uh, it was, it, we had that, we had to establish our style playing, you know, with two will take the way, let your music take your mind. Although we were influenced by James Brown and Sly and all those guys, but we had, we were coming into our own, you know, with uh, songs like that. Who's gonna take the way, and, you know, I'll let your music take your mind, uh, chocolate, buttermilk, see your tranquility, breeze and soul. Yeah, the uh, who's going to take the weight? Was there something that inspired that? Uh, were you guys kind of seeing some 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 things around, and you want to see some change? Yeah, but also, uh, who's going to take the weight? It's an interesting story with that song because we were rehearsing uh, some choreography in Jersey City, trying to keep, compete with Skip Sunny and the Pace Brothers. So we had this guy uh, teaching us some steps in Jersey City and this basement where he rehearsed, uh, did some of his dance stuff. And we're trying to learn the steps and everything. All of a sudden, uh, uh, two cops come in. And we try to say, well, what the, who is this? And they come and say, oh, uh, what's this? What's that? And uh, they go in the corner and they was, uh, had a little bag of, uh, at that time they called it Doogee. And we said, we don't know what the hell's going on here. But the guy who was teaching us the steps was also, you know, dealing in drugs. So we got jammed that night. So it was like, who's going to take the weight? It wasn't our drugs. So who is going to take the weight? So we wrote a song about it. Ah, see, you turned the lemon lemon into lemonade with that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Um, that uh, live at the Sax Machine also had a track "Funky Man," which seemed almost like it was the very early precursor of like the Jungle Boogie kind of thing, with you know the the voice vocal part of it and all that. Okay, yeah, that yeah, "Funky Man" was uh, another one. From funky man, funky stuff, you know. There's so many great tracks, cool. I mean, God, but uh, NT is another great one. Um, well, you know how that came about? Tell me. We created the song because a lot of times we'll go into the studio and we just grew. And uh, so when we finished, we said, Well, what are we going to call this? I said, I don't know. We didn't have a title. I said, Okay, no title. <laughs> NT. That's <laughs> how I became NT. That's funny. That's the kind of thing that usually would just be on the tape, but not actually go to the record. Yeah, that, yeah, we have fun with that one too. Who were uh, you mentioned uh, these these acts that I had actually never heard of before that you were competing with early on? But um, who are some of the uh, recognizable uh, acts that you went out with in the earlier years? Well, um, kind of in mid seventies. Uh, well, a couple of things. You know, we used to go out on these tours, uh, these uh, 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 R and B tours, and it would be the Delphonics, and uh, it would be uh, the Intruders. Uh, then we had the uh, the Moments and the Stylistics, and you know, but we were like the only. Uh, band out there. Then later it came the Ohio Players and uh, the P-Funk Mob, George Clinton and all those guys, you know. Uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. But some of the acts we went out with in the 70s. Well, but early on, though, so you were kind of uh, 
different. You were with the soul singing groups and you were the only band. Right. We were playing the funk when they were doing the singing the soul, you know? <laughs> yeah, like like the Delphines, for instance, or, you know, the stylistics, you know? It was yeah. uh, quite interesting. Wow. So, uh, Music is a Message, that was um, this one. And um, great title song, but also uh, Soul Vibration, really cool track. Um, Music is a Message is the one that, to me, kind of set the tone for what came with Hollywood Swinging later. You know, you kind of get that group vocal finally going, you know, and you're kind of developing those group vocals. Yeah, those street vocals. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, Music is the Message. Uh, that was a very interesting album for us also. And uh, again, uh, Soul Vibration. That was an interesting funk track for us, you know. That, did, that had a little James Brown flavor to it, you know, <laughs> a little bit. How, how did you guys, what was it like in the studio? Because it sounded like it was a nonstop party. That's what it was. We just let it go. You know, we just let the groove go. And we played and played and figure out what we had afterwards. A lot of our music was like that. That's how funky stuff was. That's how Jungle Boogie was. And Hollywood Swing. And then Rick West came up. But the concept, he did the vocal on how he was swinging. But yeah, that's what, that's what we did. Were, were you having as much fun as it sounded? Yes, of course, man. But nothing but a party. Some serious groups. But yet the, uh, the music was so precise, though. You know, it's kind of like such a loose vibe, but the music was just on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, coming from out of the 60s and how the horns players played and how I played on, on the drummer. See, the horns was like our singers. We didn't really have singers. We had some chants stuff going on, but the horns was like the singers. And that's why you heard all those uh, different lines with the horn section, which was spearheaded by my brother, uh, Carlis Ronald. We call them the gang horns. I mean, they're one of the best horn sections of all time. <clears throat> and very distinctive in the way those horns would just kind of like do a lot of like blasts of brass and kind of squeals. You know what I mean? Really distinctive. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that was my brother Ronald. You know, rap, rap, da 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 da. You know, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I love because when you do those, they would do those kinds of squeals and blasts, and it just would hit, hits you right there, you know. Okay, very good. Um, so the epic came, of course, that we uh, mentioned earlier in '73. Uh, this one, which I mean, took you guys to a completely new level. Um, do you remember anything in particular about those sessions and making this what really is a funk masterpiece? Well, um, we had um, we were recording a lot of territorial hits and with the like records, and um, they came to us one day and they said, "Well, listen, uh, we have a, a producer that we want you guys to work with," and he just he was just coming off the hit uh, "So Makusa" by Mongo Domingo, and we said, "Okay." So we met the guy once and we weren't feeling it. So what we did, that's when we went into Baggy's studio uh, in the village. And we went in there like eight o'clock in the morning and we just started jamming. And by the time we finished, we had created funky stuff, jungle boogie and Hollywood swinging. Needless to say, the record company didn't come and <laughs> try to force the producer on them at that point. They said, we're doing what we do. This is our thing, the Cool and the Gang thing. And we created three big hits. Yeah, and they're actually, they're all in a row. Too. Uh, well, no, there's uh, three in a row, and then you skip one and get Hollywood swinging. But um, 
how convinced were you when you laid down these tracks and you heard him back that they were going to be his? Well, we really didn't know, uh, but we were, we know that we, you know, uh, what we had was good. I mean, we felt good about it because we were under pressure and we was just jamming. It was like, okay, you got a backs on the wall, we'll get off the wall, I'll show you something. <laughs> that reminds me of later get down on it, but yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, the groove was so tight on um, funky stuff with that rhythm guitar that, you know, you almost had to like double check the groove to make sure it wasn't skipping because it was so tight. It almost sounded like at that one part where there's an extended rhythm guitar. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When we got to the groove of the song. Yeah. That ring. Of da -da 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 -da. Yeah. Yeah. So and then, of course, Jungle Boogie has gone on. To, to be so famous subsequent years. I mean, it must be a thrill, you know, when it was used in things like Pulp Fiction and just, you know, been sampled. And it's just such a, yeah. all these decades later, such a classic. Yeah, yeah, Jungle Boogie, yeah, definitely. And then we kind of came out with Jungle Jazz. So we just went on the track again and we just jammed on Jungle Jazz. So we had Jungle Boogie and Jungle Jazz. Yeah, that one was on the uh, Spirit of the Boogie, right? That was true. Yeah, Spirit yeah, the, the boogie. boogie. Some very cool flute work on that one. Mm hmm Yeah. Um, but Hollywood Swinging for sure kind of changed the template for Cool and the Gang with being a, a, a real true vocal record. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, Ricky West, the late, late as I call him, Ricky West. He was a, he was the guy for Hollywood Swinging. How did that record uh, change your lives in terms of you know uh, your your lifestyle and your and your touring and all that? Yeah, well, we uh, of course you got uh, three big uh, number. I mean, it was all three directions were number one R and B uh, and. Uh, they also were in the top five pop, you know. I think uh, Hollywood was two and Jungle Boogie and uh, well, Funky Stuff was in the top forty on the pop side. I mean, on the yeah, but on the uh, but we had uh, you know Jungle Boogie and Hollywood Swinging went up all the way up to the top five. Were you um, keeping track much of what like other contemporaries were doing at that time, or were you just kind of in your own cool in the game bubble, you know? Well, yeah, we were in the cooling game bubble. We started watching what was going on with the charts and other artists and other competitors after, the, you know, around mid-70s. You know, understanding the Billboard charts and the cash box chart and the record world charts, you know. So we started to study the business a little more then. Did, did you feel more pressure when you came back uh, with this one to, you know, replicate those hits? That light of worlds, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, that was this uh, album with Summer Madness on there. That's beauty. We got, we got a chance to stretch out again. People thought that uh, it was Herbie Hancock, and he had so many different names because you know, Summer Madness was on the B side of Spirit of the Boogie, and uh, there was a DJ in Chicago flipped the record. I started playing Summer Madness. And then he asked his audience, so who is this? He said, uh, Hancock, you know, uh, Quincy Jones. Uh, they, they couldn't believe it was cool in the game. The Summer Madness is just beautiful. Um, the keyboard on that is just something else. Yeah, yeah, my brother uh, Ronald, he uh, played that solo on there. Yeah, just got that arm synthesizer, and he was having a ball. <laughs> well, he knew how to use it right. <laughs> yeah. This uh, record also had Higher Plane, which is one of my favorite tracks. Um, Street Corner Symphony. So you had some hits on here. It was hard it was hard to have as many as Wild and Peaceful, but you definitely kept the heat coming with Light of Worlds. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a street corner uh, symphony and uh, Higher Plains. Higher Plains is one of those uh, haunting groups, you know, or Higher Plains. Yeah, yeah. So you were doing, uh, obviously, a lot more TV appearances and all that. Um, is there anything uh, from that period, Cool, that stands out as, like, a, a really unforgettable memory, either from like a TV appearance or one of your concerts, whether it's good or bad, but just for some reason or funny, whatever? Well, we were having good times, um, you know, at that time with uh, Soul Train and, you know, uh, uh, Midnight Special and all those uh, interesting uh, TV shows, you know, where, the, where, the, where you can really stretch out. And... Um, the guys, uh, the homeless would uh, get into their solos, and it wasn't like sometimes we just have to play the record the way that it is. We, we played the record the way that we felt at the time. And did you uh, get a lot into the uh, choreography and costumes and things like that? Yeah, that kind of started happen, um, happening around that time. You know, we, we had some interesting gear. <laughs> we had some interesting costumes, yeah. How, how would you describe your bass style and your approach to bass, Cool? Because, you know, I mean, that bottom was so solid, but you weren't flashy like a, you know, maybe like a Larry Graham. It was more in the style of like, a, you know, um, the Ohio Players bass player and the, and the Motown stuff. How would you describe your approach to bass? Yeah, I would um, would say um, kind of uh, Ron Carter slash um, you know Jimmy was a little, uh, he was he was in the group, but he he got a little fancy there. See, my my style wasn't one of um, like Stanley Clark or uh, you know uh, moving all over the place. My thing was, um, I work with the drummer. I, we always felt that the foundation of the music start with the drums, and then with the drums and the bass lock into the drums, then you're building the house now, and then you got the keyboards on top, and then you get the guitars on top. So if I was moving all over the place, it's, it's not a strong foundation, you know? And that's how, you know, we, we, we create our music. No doubt. So I also had here the uh, this one that you had mentioned, Spur of the Boogie. Right. It was ca kind of interesting to me, Cool, because it, logically it seems like this would have followed Jungle Boogie, but you actually did The Light of Worlds and then came back to it on this one. Okay. Well, we was uh, just having a good time, you know, uh, in terms of how they're going to be categorized, categorized, you know, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Spirit of the Boogie was, um, had a jungle boogie kind of vibe with it, with a, with a different twist, you know, the way that uh, we uh, created Spirit of the Boogie, you know. You know. I think that uh, that track might be your hardest hitting of all the rhythm tracks. You think so? I think it might be. <laughs> it was a driving boom now. The spirit of the boogie was, uh, <laughs> we felt the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the uh, winter sadness, the kind of response to summer madness. Summer madness, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you really stretched out in Caribbean festival. Yeah, that was, uh, we were kind of like inspired when we went down to Trinidad and Barbados and went down to the islands. We came up with Caribbean Festival. What, um, what would you say was the key or a couple of the keys to the chemistry of Cool in the Gang, you know, that made you guys work together so well as a unit? Well, because we we started so young, we grew up together. We knew each other because you know we, you know, between um, like I said, going back to the Soul Town band and you know learning those songs together and 
you know, feeling that energy and uh, evolving into what became the Cool in the Gang sound. I believe that definitely was the, uh, the chemistry, you know, of that. We just knew each other, felt each other, felt each other's groove. Did you spend a lot of time uh, rehearsing and, and, and all that? I mean, was it a 24-7 thing? Well, in the beginning, yeah, in the beginning, we rehearsed a lot and played a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, that's how we created a lot of those songs, rehearsing and coming up with ideas and feels and whatever, you know. George might kick off with a beat, and then I might just, you know, fall in. It was that kind of a thing. Charles would come up with these slick guitar parts. Sometimes it plays like, sometimes it sounds like two two guitar players playing. Who was who was sort of the taskmaster or drill sergeant, making sure that was, uh, you I would say it was Charles and my brother. Yeah. Yeah, because Charles was, uh, you know, he was kind of that kind of a guy, you know. Oh, you gotta position your hand this way, and you gotta put the pressure down. I said, man. I, don't, I ain't feeling it like that. <laughs> I'm just playing it because he was the technical guy. You know, he had a because I had a small hand. I said I can't, I can't stretch my fingers the way I would. You want me to do, man? I said let me do my thing. <laughs> I would like to have been a, a fly on the wall for some of that. <laughs> this this record, um, love and understanding. Things kind of started to change for you guys a little bit with that one. I thought that title song was fantastic. It's one of my favorites. Um, the way you guys build the tension and love and understanding and then hit those right. horn blasts, it's phenomenal. Somebody but, uh, was just talking about that song. Yeah, I mean, uh, love and understanding was just uh, one of those uh, songs. And, uh, uh, the title and what we're talking about, you know, so many things going on in the world. In the world, we need a little bit more love and understanding if we can all get along together, you know. And it's, it, it, it's just, you're right. We just kept building it and building it. And the song got uh, larger and larger. And in the end, you know, come together. It's time for love and understanding. And yeah. It was a time. We can drive it now. We need to come together. Listen to us. <laughs> yeah. What what uh, inspired you guys to put like three live tracks on there? And... Well, you know what? We just kind of did things. It wasn't uh, um, no set thing. You know, we like this track. We put this track on. Like, um, you know, we always like to mix up the combination of, of live and studio. Then you came back with uh, Open Sesame, and that track uh, got picked up by Saturday Night Live, which I'm sure uh, didn't hurt sales. Uh, but the group uh, started to go through a transition period in the late 70s. What uh, Was it just that music was changing so much, or were things changing in the band also? Well, I, I think that the music was changing, and uh, things were changing in the band to some degree. Because that, that latter part, you know, uh, was a strong heavy disco thing going on. And then there was the anti-disco movement that was going on. And uh, people uh, were burning records in Chicago and all that kind of stuff. But Open Sesame was our answer to a dance disco kind of a record. Because on, uh, we put the four on the floor, but we listened to those horn sessions. That was jazz over the on the four beat, you know, and it was a little, 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 little uh, uh, well, very heavy syncopated, you know. And then we uh, had that uh, mid ish and uh, uh, intro to that, you know. And we kept that thing. So you hear jazz and funk all up under there. On the, I don't think we people really heard that in a dance record. Yeah, had you traveled? Uh, did that inspire the theme, or what? How did that come about? That was my brother again. He was just actually it was a 
someone, I guess, uh, asked it to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Because <laughs> Earth, Wind, and Fire had their little stick horn lines and horn parts. And so we, we came up with our stick line and horn parts. You came up uh, with two more albums before the big change um, at the end of the decade, uh, The Force and Everybody's Dancing. The Force, I thought, was actually more of a kind of return to the classic Cool in the Gang sound, and then Everybody's Dancing was trying to incorporate a little more disco and stuff like that. Yeah, that album, yeah. You're right. It was a combination of disco, and but we always kept that funk thing happening, too, though. Yeah, well, especially there's a lot of funk on the force. I think that record was overlooked by a lot of people, and I think fans of the classic Cool in the Gang sound should check out the force. Yeah, I mean, uh, they should go back and check it out because uh, we were doing some interesting things in there as a force, you know, driving force, you know, yeah. Definitely, of course. It's not Star- been influenced by Star Wars or something. <laughs> you know, this is the Star Wars funk. Yeah, you know, check this out. <laughs> Did you, you carry lightsabers onto stage back then? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just loved the music, man. We just tried a whole lot of different things, and, you know, and we, and we kept it moving. Well, I'll tell you, when I first heard, you know, um, Ladies Night in 79, um, I was a DJ at the time, and um, I was, you know, blown away that it was Cool in the gang. I mean, the horns, yeah, okay, yeah, and the rhythm, yeah. But big change with JT coming in for the vocals and uh, production was definitely different. Um, how did that transition occur, Cool? Well, uh, we were out on tour uh, late 78, 1 to 79 with the Jacksons. And uh, um, a guy by the name of Dick Griffey, who was the uh, – uh, the promoter of the tour, he came up to this, came up to us, and he said, "Hey, you know, you guys sound great. You're doing good." He said, "But I think you need a lead singer." And we said, "Oh, okay." So we thought about it, and a lot of our music, you know, you could actually sing over it, you know, but our horns were our singers. So when we decided to do that. Uh, we were working at the House of Music in Jersey, uh, West Orange, New Jersey. And uh, the owner of the studio recommended, I got a guy that might, you guys might like. We said, oh, yeah, who? So they recommended uh, James Taylor, JT. And then my brother played some tracks uh, for him, and he wanted to see how he moves in between progressive chord changes and stuff like that. And uh, and uh, it worked out okay. I was hanging out in New York with my wife, and every um, weekend they would have a ladies' night. So we were creating the music, and I came back to the studio. You know what? We should write a song about the ladies. Every Friday night, Saturday night, ladies' night. I said, wow, man, that might be a good idea. And so we did. Then Frankie Crocker, the chief rocker they call in New York, broke the record, and the rest is history. It definitely was a sign of the times. I mean, the disco scene, and I mean, the whole lady, every disco had a ladies' night, you know? And uh, it was a good and a bad thing. You know, it was a double-edged sword. You know, you kind of get annoyed because you kind of have to, like, wait outside, and, and they were getting in free. But at the same time, the club was packed full of the ladies. <laughs> oh yeah we had fun with that one too yeah um i actually got to interview uh jt back i think it was like 89 when i was with uh black radio exclusive uh he was uh do- trying to do a solo thing at that point but yeah right um so when that record took off well first of all uh deodato came in as producer what was it like to work with with him well, it was great working with Diodato, you know. Um, I mean, he came from a, sort of a jazz, progressive jazz background. And uh, although some of the other guys in the band, my brother and Spike, some of the guys felt that we were going to be kind of jazzy <laughs> with Diodato. Oh, wow, we got Diodato working with us, you know. 
But the other said, listen, guys, you have a lead singer there. So you have to work the music around the singer. So all the nice, slick stuff that y'all been doing, we got to back off of that a little bit and make it work. So he was a good producer for that, you know. Back with ladies, you only heard the stabs in the beginning, you know. You know, uh, you didn't hear horn changes going all through the music, you know. So it was great. We learned a lot from Vietnam. Was there any concern within the band at all that you might be um, alienating, you know, the fans from the past? Uh, of course, you were gaining all new fans. But how did you feel about that balance of keeping rooted in the Cool in the Gang sound you had created and then the new Cool in the Gang? Well, I mean, we had com some concerns about that. I mean, um, we, um, you know, um, when you have a lead singer, it's a little different than our fans. And we were pretty much all, you know, chant sort of uh, funky style playing music. But we tried to hold on to it as much as we could, like get down on it. Get down on it, it had a uh, sort of a funk, um, reggae thing happening with it and became a big record for us you know and then um other songs um we started growing a little bit in other areas like uh, tonight it was almost slightly rock emergency had a rock feel to it a little bit what rock funk so we were just continuing to grow man that's what we did Misled, too, had a little bit of that rock flavor. Yeah, that's another one. Um, but, yeah, you can hear the funk coming through uh, tracks like um, um, If You Want It. And um, what's is what's the title of that one, If You Want It? Here it is. Say again? That track, If You Want It. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you can have it if you want it. Yeah. That yeah, was yeah. more uh, uh, Marvin Gaye play, you know? Yeah, but that had some funk in it too. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, so you guys went to a whole new level. What did it feel like being, you know, kind of kings of, kings of the pop charts? Well, it felt good. I mean, uh, I mean, we because we were doing us, you know, we weren't following any particular pop record or covering a pop record. It was just what we were doing that the pop world started to accept, you know. And how were you coming up with all those songs? I mean, uh, Celebration, of course, became, you know, like an anthem across the world, pretty much. How, how did you guys keep the, the consistency that you guys had from like 79 to the mid 80s was just incredible. How did you mm -hmm. do that? Well, celebration was a celebration because uh, we had just won uh, three um, American Music Awards with Ladies Night, and then my brother, my brother came in, and he um, says, "You know what? There's a part of there's a part of celebration. There's a part of celebration that." Uh, had a uh, uh, let's all celebrate, and he came up with a song called Celebration. So let's take a little bit of that and create celebration. And it had that rock sort of rock and cheer sort of a vibe. Yeah. Well, we'll try to wrap this up. I wanted to definitely though mention um, what you have going currently with your son. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing with with your son, Hakeem? Well, you know, his uh, song is called Royalty, and uh, um, it's coming out, um, starting to push it out with a video and everything. And uh, he, he traveled with us also. You know, we did 48 shows with Van Halen. He was on, uh, on the road with us, 10 shows with Kid Rock, you know, a Dave Matthew band, and et cetera. So um, he's, uh, you know, he grew up with us. He grew up around us. He, he understands what we do. He's a DJ, but also a writer, and uh, he's having fun. What, what, what's your top advice that you give him from your experience? Say again? 
What is the top advice that you give him from all of your experience? Well, I mean, just stay true to what he's doing and uh, don't give up, you know. Uh, he's giving me, me some advice now. Hey, hey Dad, uh, the, the millennial new rule ain't quite got all them horns in there, man. You got, you got to... You have to get it to what's going on. I, I listen to us. Yeah, okay. We, we try we try to relate to the younger audience. Yeah. <laughs> now, are are you guys still going to do some more new music, or are you going to hear new Cole in the Gang? Yeah, well, we're going to work on a... We want to do a jazz album, a cool jazz style album. I know we did one we called to, uh, Cool Jazz. And uh, we are looking to do um, an album called... Uh, Legacy as a working title. Legacy. Well, that's great. That beats NT. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so um, lastly, before I let you go, cool, what would you say is your biggest thrill or what are you most proud of looking back over these 50 years? Well, there's a lot of hot spots, you know, <laughs> over the 50 years. But I would say, um, one on the record side, uh, winning the Grammy, you know, the various awards, and then um, uh, doing a big concert with Elton John up in England, over 100 some thousand people, uh, playing in Kenya for an AIDS awareness concert, over half a million people. And the thing was no glove, no love, protect yourself. You know, because of the problems we have with AIDS and different diseases around the world. Um, doing the show in Nigeria for the children of Africa with the blessings of the late Nelson Mandela. It's been a lot of highlights, man. A lot of highlights. Wow, that's incredible. I bet you never envisioned that when you were playing with the Jazz Yaks, did you? No. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we've been blessed, man. And, uh, we're just going to try to continue to keep it moving and keep it grooving. That's the, my saying is keep it moving and moving. Is there anything else you'd like to add to the fans before uh, we part? Well, um, I always uh, like to thank my fans uh, for supporting Cool in the Game uh, for so many years. Because um, uh, we got fans of the uh, 70s and the 80s and 80s. 90s and all the different things that we did. Uh, we were um, band, uh, there to take a chance. In other words, you know, well, you got to keep that same formula of your last record. You know, that's a record company coming to you, you know, that like McDonald's and Burger King, you know. No, we wasn't the McDonald's and Burger King band. We did what we wanted to do. And sometimes it was risky because we didn't know how the people would accept it or not. You take a song like pneumonia, you know, with the type of rhythm was behind pneumonia, you know? And they said, well, what's that? <laughs> that's what we did. And that's what we do. Cool, it's been such a thrill. Thank you so much for spending the time and finding a place uh, to get this done where you're at. So much appreciated and continued success to you guys always. And uh, just a lot of gratitude for all the great music you've brought into all of our lives. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Hey, well, that was big fun, big time. As mentioned at the outset, we had to hold off the onrush of intruders toward the end. And so the JT era discussion was cut a little short, but overall, we got it done. I was most interested in a deep dive into the 1969 to 79 hardcore funk period anyway. Did you catch that one oblivious guy in the background shot near the end? It's too funny. Regardless, as always, Cool was a cool customer, and it was such a thrill to connect with him and bring it to all of you. A huge thanks again to Mr. Robert Cool Bell for both the glorious body of work he has bestowed upon us and for spending time sharing his incredible musical life with us. And as always, again, a sincere thank you to you, the viewers and supporters of Truth and Rhythm. Speaking of which, be on the lookout for upcoming episodes on YouTube, FunkinStuff.net, iTunes, and other leading providers. As well, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm resides. Also, Truth and Rhythm Quick Takes, which are excerpts of the show 
little snippets of musical history. If you're already subscribing, tell a friend, tell family members. We need that support. Show these fantastic uh, makers and creators of funk, jazz, and R&B and other key figures to the genres that you love what they've done, that it means a lot to you in your lives. Support this program. Also, email me. Write me at scottg at funkinstuff.net and let me know who else you'd like to see on the show, what you've really enjoyed, what you'd like to you know, maybe see in the future, see something different, anything. Just drop me a line. Love hearing from you guys. It's a two-way street. This is your show for the real music lover and enthusiast. And with that, as always, time to sign off. Scott, Dr. GX Goldfight saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.